New details tonight on that plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Sean Fix, one of the 13 men accused in an alleged plot against Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, faced a judge via Zoom today on state firearms and terrorist act charges. This was a, a, a very serious, thought out uh, plot. Seven men in total are facing criminal charges under Michigan's Anti-Terrorism Act. Some also appeared in court yesterday. Six other suspects are facing federal charges of conspiracy to kidnap. This is a highly dangerous group. They were well armed, they were training, they had a plan. Authorities claim their goal was to kidnap Governor Whitmer before Election Day and also allegedly bomb the state Capitol building and attack law enforcement, all in an attempt to violently overthrow state governments they felt were violating the U.S. Constitution. Prosecutors say they even discussed with undercover agents alleged plans to put Whitmer on trial and execute her. Agents discovering the group had trained, made explosives, and exchanged tactical gear this week. While many praised Whitmer for her aggressive action to stop COVID, some in the state have criticized her for the state's COVID-19 restrictions. And she's blaming the Trump administration's rhetoric for inspiring violent extremists. This White House has a duty to call it out and they won't do it. In April, the president tweeted there was a need to liberate Michigan. In May, armed protesters showed up outside the state capitol demanding those orders be lifted. Very, very important that firstly, we take um, these types of groups, white supremacy groups, militia groups, extremist organizations, very, very seriously. Last night, Trump tweeted he doesn't tolerate any extreme violence. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident, nor is that the only dangerous group out there. A recent report shows that the number of white nationalist hate groups has grown by 55 percent just since 2016. Let's bring in my next guest. Cynthia Miller Idris is a professor at American University. She's also the author of Hate in the Homeland. Cynthia, you literally wrote the book on far right hate groups, or at least one of them. So I'm curious your reaction when you heard President Trump's attack on Governor Whitmer after the plot to kidnap and possibly murder her had been busted, and also Trump's stand back and stand by comment to the Proud Boys at the debate. I mean, as a scholar of uh, far right extremist groups, um, it's a distressing uh, development when elected officials or authorities at any level um, are, you know, say things and use their words in ways that then get Legitim you know, perceived as legitimizing from within the groups. And that's exactly what we saw, for example, in the debate, is that even if the, those words are walked back later, they were perceived and received immediately online by far-right groups across the spectrum as a call to action. How linked in your mind is the resurgence of white supremacy in the United States with the rise of Donald Trump in American politics? And is it all anecdotal or, or, or is there actual solid data to show there's a connection? Well, I think the first thing that's important to know is that the resurgence of far-right extremism and right-wing terror, which is primi primarily white supremacist extremism nature, is global. So we've seen a 320% increase in, uh, in right-wing terror over the past five years. And the numbers of hate groups were skyrocketing before Donald Trump was elected. So I think in many ways what we've seen over the last several years is is a lot of rhetoric and language that is perceived as legitimizing or that helps to normalize and mainstream, um, you know, some of the extremist ideas, xenophobic ideas into immigrant ideas in ways that certainly haven't helped and, and, and probably have helped, um, uh, you know, mobilize or, or legitimize. But I, I don't think we can really place the solution or you know, the blame or the solution on one administration, um, meaning that even as we move beyond this administration, at some point, we continue to live with this problem. Trump's whistles to those groups have been a lot more direct than what we've seen in the past. I mean, politicians have played to racial fears throughout American history, but rarely as overtly as Trump seems to. We had the Willie Horton ad for George H.W. Bush, and Trump certainly wasn't the first American to make sure the country knew that the full name of our last president was Barack Hussein Obama. But we didn't see anywhere close to the same response in terms of membership in hate groups and, and how visible those white supremacy groups have been. Is that just a coincidence or does that sort of help show the impact that Trump is and has had? 
There's no question that what we know from the research is that words from elected officials matter. And what we have seen in empirical studies is that in general, when elected officials use incendiary rhetoric or anti-immigrant rhetoric and words, violence against those groups goes up. And so although I don't know of any studies yet that have shown a direct correlation, and that's why it feels like a lot of speculation and it feels like a lot of anecdote, we know from other research and other settings that the, the words of elected officials are connected to violence when they use incendiary rhetoric, when elected officials walk that language back and start using more positive language to talk about immigrants, for example, violence goes down. And so I think we have every expectation that those same kinds of patterns hold true here. And it's why elected officials are held to a higher standard and should be held to a higher standard in terms of their accountability with what words they use. There are growing fears of what these groups might do on Election Day or after Election Day if Trump loses. Trump has said he wants his supporters to act as poll watchers. There are worries that armed supporters, perhaps members of these groups, would try to serve that role and intimidate voters in the process. The biggest fear is that some sort of armed revolt might pop up should Trump lose the election. How seriously do you take those threats and should we take those threats? Because it's been at least my sense that these groups kind of tend to act like bullies. You get a lot of talk, but they often tend to walk away from a fight when they're faced with one. Yeah, these groups are decidedly fringe, and I think we have to remember that they're fringe and to not give them more power than they deserve. They, they are on the fringes, and for the most part, um, you know, the, the plots, whatever plots they've, they've plotted out have been foiled. And we have, you know, we should thank the intelligence efforts for, for foiling those plots like they did yesterday. Um, but I think everyone I know in this field is concerned about the potential for violence um, on or around election day and in the period after. And I think what we need right now is de-escalation and de, you know, a, a, no longer the kind of legitimation we've seen. We shouldn't have law enforcement thanking vigilante groups. We shouldn't have people referring to, you know, vigilantes um, as heroes. We need a, a, a change in the narrative that does not position those kinds of actions as heroic, because otherwise that will bring more people into the streets. Finally, one of the reasons why this Whitmer plot in Michigan has made so many headlines, not just because of the details of it, but because it's so unusual. Uh, can you think of another instance where a, a group, one of these uh, white supremacist or far right groups, has targeted a specific politician? Is it just that our memories have lapsed? Political kidnappings are common globally as a tactic. I cannot think of another example. There must be examples, uh, and I'm sure right after this conversation, I'll go look them up and, and realize I shouldn't have forgotten them. But there are uh, examples of other targeted um, attacks on individuals, usually journalists or anti-fascist activists. Um, in Germany last year, we had a an assassination of a politician by a far right extremist group, uh, by far right extremist individual, excuse me. And so, you know, this is not a totally uncommon tactic, but it does represent something unfamiliar to most Americans and newer in the context that we've been dealing with over the past several years. Cynthia Miller Idris is a sociology professor at American University in Washington, D.C. She is also the author of Hate in the Homeland, the New Global Far Right. Cynthia, thanks for a few minutes. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And up next, we pivot to 2020 vision. We'll show you where the race for the White House stands. We're also going to discuss the future of the Republican Party, whether or not it'll be able to get its reputation back in the post-Trump world we hope arrives in January.